And we're back. Dan, you beautiful man. Thank you so much for joining me here, man. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's, uh, is this our sec only our second time? I think this, well, this is our third time. We were two on the last podcast. This is the first time hosting you on this show. So. Got it. Yeah. Okay. That's, that was where the confusion was in my head. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. It's good to be back. Yeah, no, it's great to see. It's been about, I think six months since we, since we last connected and yeah. um, yeah. And you know, since that time, as I was just telling you off air, um, you know, one of the things that's been huge for me is I just finished one of your recent books, 40 years with a whistle, which yeah. is one of my, uh, favorites now just coming in. I'm excited to just jam with you and, uh, and connect with you again. So thanks for the time. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> I think my last two books, 40 years and attempts are my best work, but they don't sell. <laughs> um, books just don't sell anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the music industry, the publishing industry, and I'd even say the music industry. <clears throat> uh, it, it, it's just a strange time. I don't think anybody knows what works anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the best films I've seen in years is a show called Licorice Pizza. And yet I couldn't explain what oh. happened in the show to save my life, but I found okay. it delightful <laughs> and fun. And uh, I'll go back tonight and watch it again. And yet, you know, I, I don't know if I can stomach another Marvel film, okay. you know, um, there's a show on uh, Disney Plus called the Boba Fett, which and, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the Mandalorian. And I mean, so I, I have a point. So just, yeah, you know, with me, you always just have oh, to absolutely. wait. Absolutely. I got you. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm just right. leaning back, just ready to roll. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You know, like the Mandalorian and Boba Fett. Now, don't forget, I am a, I'm an original. I'm an OG when it comes to Star Wars geekdom. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I watched Star Wars in the front row and uh, Greg Winslow's Audi Fox at a drive-in. Uh, we, we watched it back to back. We got home at about 5 a.m. And I was like, it was worth it, you know? And uh, the, the second one, Empire. And of course, after that, I think it all goes downhill. But uh, when you watch The Mandalorian, you watch the Boba Fett series, uh, even, even on Marvel, the Loki and the, some of those other ones, you can't make movies like they make those shows. Mm -hmm. You know, could you imagine people sitting in a theater for eight hours while this, this dense, complex show ends up? And I think what's happened is, and my point, ding, ding, ding. I don't, I think people are starting to look at books like they look at movies. They, they want them doled out, you know, uh, you know, here, oh, and it has to be free. That's the other thing too. Mm -hmm. Here's something free and here's something free and here's something free. <laughs> and when you read it all, you have everything I know and uh, for free and without the rigor, the discipline or the check for, <laughs> for finding mm -hmm. out what I know, which is why it doesn't stick. Huh. So we are in a strange time in the business because no matter, there's this new formula for writing books where you, you give away 90% of it and then hope people want the, the other 10%. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's huh, strange. That's it. Do you think it's the technology aspect of it oh. where now there's audiobook and there's, and yeah. everything's on video and stuff too. So you kind of have to, you, you almost have to repurpose it and sell it in different ways in order to yeah. kind of get the full spectrum of people. Yeah. I mean, back when I was, when I was young and we would talk about, uh, when I was first teaching, you know, we talk about Charles Dickens. And when you realize he got paid, he and Dumas, Alexander Dumas, got paid by the word. Then all of a sudden, when you read the books and the students be like with Pickwick papers, okay, we're on this great story. And then like for five chapters, it goes off in this direction that, yeah, because he was getting paid by the word. And he probably had this nice little idea and he just flickered <laughs> away and, uh, in, in 2022, 2023, at, you're just happy if you get paid at all, you know, because, you know, I go, there's, there's these sites online that give away PDFs. My books are all there. Mm -hmm. Every one of my books. And we could probably, I could probably hire someone to, to just send in uh, intellectual property violations with it's called Scribd mm -hmm. daily, every single day of the week. Mm -hmm. And it, well, what it does is it makes people not want to mm -hmm. you know, sell books. Now I write books for different reasons than other people. Right. Um, but uh, if you're if you're in the business now to make money and I even as much money that can be made in motion pictures, I, I imagine they're even just going, whoa, mm -hmm. there's a wonderful Monty Python uh, documentary mm -hmm. where they can't get funding for the life of Brian 
So a guy by the name of George Harrison, I guess he was in a small group called the Beatles, I believe it was called. Oh, the Beatles. Yeah. Beatles. The yeah. Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> With the uh, Rango Star, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, yeah, yes, very famous group. And so they just he goes it's the American pronunciation. I believe they call them the Beatles in, uh, the, in the Beatles. <laughs> and uh, so George Harrison tells my uh, Python, he goes, "Well, I'll give you the money." They and you can only imagine how much money did they make. So my, I guess my thought is we're in this funny time again, where if you write a book, you're not going to make any money for it. If you but the, the interesting thing is the same person who wants, I need sound fitness advice, will, will buy a DVD set called Idiocy. And they'll spend, you know, $99.95 on a, a DVD set or, or, or a streaming program called Idiocy. Uh, we know that treadmills are used in the United States 7.2 times before they become clothes holders. They'll spend $4,000 on a treadmill, but not $19 on a book. You know, I, so I, I, I'm not complaining. This is just the way the way it is. Yeah. And the it's so, uh, yes, it's just it's fascinating because it, it's like such an interesting debate and topic. I know the technology is one big thing, but mm -hmm. it's like it's and, you know, books. I believe I've, I remember Chuck Polinuk, uh, the author of Fight Club, kind of yeah, said sure. this about it's a you know, books are a little bit more of a commitment. It takes some time, um, you know, uh, in that aspect. yeah, it, which is, you know, definitely understandable. But you know, it's funny, the, the thing that's popping in my head with uh, superhero movies is, I don't know if you ever saw the Zack Snyder version of Justice League. It's like the four and a half hour version that he no. wanted to release. No. And then they cut it up and chopped it up into like an hour and 45 minutes or whatever. Oh. oh. The one that they released is half garbage. The four and a half hour one of substance and deep darkness that he put into that is an unbelievable movie. And kind of going into the point that you said about the Star Wars series and how deep they could get into it. It's almost like once you once you get through the initial character development and you really start falling in love with the characters, you want to see that all the way through. Yeah. So I would almost seem like it might be the same thing with books of kind of the, the hook at the beginning and then all of a sudden you got them. That's actually a very interesting point. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can sub, uh, I can, I can explain to you uh, easy strength in literally a couple sentences, and you could even start training easy strength exactly like I did. Pavel gave me a couple sentences, and I started doing it and I had great success. But there's there's a couple of parts here. So here's what you know how to do. Well, then you have to do it. I got a I got a question today from. Uh, somebody in Scandinavia about why I am, why I was talking about this exercise called power curls. Well, my first text back, my first email back was, have you ever done it? It was like, no, because every single one of the questions would have been answered by one set of doing the exercise, not one day of it, not one year, one set of eight. So about a five. 20, about a 20 second commitment to what it would have answered every yeah. single one of the questions, you know, but that's, you know, here's an exercise that Al Order, the four-time Olympic gold medals in the discus, recommended. Stefan Fernholm, a good friend of mine, Swedish national champion. Ricky Brook, world record holder in the discus, all recommended. And yet this person wants the scientific research behind it. It's like, and, and I'm not ripping on the question. I'm just saying that there's, I can tell you in 30 seconds, the best training program you'll ever do in your damn life. But then it's up to you to do it. You know, well, it's like the best thing about Seinfeld's book on humor is that little quote right at the end is, you know, here's the joke, but you have to put yourself into it to make it funny. Yes. You know, you have to, you have to add your, you know, you have to add, you know. Uh, yeah. So. You know, that's, a, that's something that I've thought of a lot, especially in this last year, kind of in the middle of all this weird time of what we had the last mm -hmm. couple of years with stuff and mm -hmm. realizing how so many people were going to gyms, they were going to training, they were following a plan of what to do. But then once they actually got home and all of a sudden that gym and the environment wasn't there anymore, they had no idea what the fuck to do anymore. And it's like, so actually, and I think one of the pillars of uh, coaching that you talked about in your book, 40 Years of Wish, was about taking ownership, about clients taking ownership of the program. It's kind of, I believe what you're really saying right here is like, you can, you can lay out the best program possible in 30 seconds flat, but then it's up to you to find how it's best suited for you, what your capabilities are, where you are at this moment and really take owner, ownership of it. Well, I mean, <laughs> 
I love that great summary of the, the whole Lord of the Rings, the hard one, the, the three books, you know, the towers, the, you know, the churn, the, the, the fellowship. The, why don't we just call it the Eagles, say, hey, Eagles, and then fly one of us. We just drop it down the hole, drop the ring down the hole. Things over. It's, you know, it's the Lord of the paragraph, you know, it's 20 minutes, boom, bitty boom, in and out, we're done. And I'm like, yeah. And it's funny because when you first hear that, you're like, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, that's good. But then you think, yeah, well, you know, and and I, I don't know what exactly my point is from saying that, but mm -hmm. uh, I can, but there's also something magnificent about reading the entire Lord of the Rings, you know, the, the way I had to read it, the three books. Mm -hmm. And when the one guy comes home, the very last line, uh, Frodo, I think it's Frodo, opens the door to his house and says, I'm home. And when you get to that line and you, you put the book down, you go, wow, that was, and then like yeah. one of my friends said, and he said, he read that line and went and he picked up the fellowship of the ring and started on page one again. Cause, and to me, to me, when you write a book or when you mm -hmm. put together a program or you bring on a client or you bring on a student or an athlete, what you're what you're basically doing is you can, okay there's two ways we can do this and i give them both we can do it the easy way coach ralph mon i want you to lift weights three days a week throw the discus four days a week for the next eight years that's what he told me that's the secret to throwing the discus for and gentle listener you're you're sitting there going wait could you say it again yes lift weights three days a week throw four for the next eight years i'll be a good discus star huh, you'll be as good as you can be ah uh, there it is but then there's that next thing. It's that, that those little teeny things we like to call details. I say eat protein, eat veggies. I get more questions about eat protein, eat veggies than I get about anything else I write. It's kind of like how many exercises should you do in the one lift a day program? Or... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Do you think then really then the, like if we're going into this of like a solution, the art of coaching is really about helping people understand and fall in love with the process rather than just what you're actually doing? I didn't like it when I first heard it, but it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's, it's a, I don't know if it's a Zen proverb. I don't know if it's a samurai proverb, but this man is being chased by a, a tiger. So he gets the end of a cliff and he's, he goes down, he goes down this, this rope. And when he looks at the bottom, there's another tiger at the bottom. And then when he looks up, he sees that there's mice nibbling on the rope. Okay. And as he's holding on tight as his life, he sees a cluster of grapes right next to him and he grabs one of them. He tastes it and, and he says, wow, what a delicious grape. The end. I hated that story. <laughs> I hated that story. You know, oh, I, remember okay. saying to the, I remember saying to the teacher, well, you know, the one that I like my chances of going back up, you know, and the teacher's like, oh, little Danny John, you just don't get it. Of course, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the, that that moment that we're, the, the, the person is living in the absolute pure present when he eats that grape. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, but the funny thing is, my mind is built to be an athlete. The moment, the moment you hand me the Super Bowl championship, put the gold medal around my neck. Somebody walks up and says, what about next year? Yeah. You know, <sighs> shit, every time, I, I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many times. I remember winning the Pleasanton Highland game. It was a long journey to win the Pleasant. It's a big Highland game. And it, I, it, it's a long convoluted story. A lot of, lot of mm -hmm. moving parts. It's overcoming really serious uh, injuries. Uh, you know, told never lift again. Uh, I had to overcome really crappy judging in the caber, really crappy judging in the caber, really crappy judging in the caber toss. How the hell I could take seventh or ninth place in the caber toss? How can everybody else turn 12s and I get a 1205? You know, bullshit. Okay, enough of that. Second, I walk down, you know, the whole crowd, 26,000 people, Danny, Danny. I walk down, a buddy of mine says, hey, you're going to be at the grandmother games next weekend over there and, you know, uh, crap hole montana mm -hmm. but I, I thought i just won the biggest games there are 
Well, you did, but you know, we're all going to, well, and that. Oh. Uh, I read something years ago and I could never find it again. It said, it talked about people who live in the pure present. And so we got Leo, my grandson upstairs. He's teething, so he's having a rough week. Uh, artists live in the pure present, you know, as good as any artist is in the world, actor or dancer or singer. You know, if they come out with a new album, you're like, God, why you write like you used to write? You know, a, a, you know, artists live in the pure present. The dying live in the pure present. In fact, I've found wonderful life insights by talking to people who've got a who've got a end date closer. Of course, not my end dates. My, I'm closer to my end date, my start date. And I know that. And then the other people who live in the pure present are athletes. And uh, it's funny because naturally as an athlete, I understand that the grape is delicious, but also as an athlete, I understand I'm going to enjoy that grape. And then I'm expected to have, you know, either I got to kill the mice to take you down. Yeah. I got to kill the mice. Mm -hmm. I got to kill the tiger. I, I got to do something. And uh, okay. well, that got heavy. Jeez. Sorry. Yeah. No, I love it. It's, it's, I mean, it's really kind of, if you can recognize the balance between both of those, right. Of it's the, the principle of being in the present. It's, you know, I forget who said this term, but I love it of, you know, living life blissfully, uh, blissfully dissatisfied where it's like you spend your time, you know, being happy about what you've done, what you've accomplished and, jo and be joyous about that. But the other part of the time, kicking yourself in the ass to keep getting better and just keep getting to that next level afterwards. You would like the work of Earl Nightingale and mm -hmm. his, his, his series Lead the Fields available on YouTube for free now. Mm -hmm. And I just bought another copy of it. Uh, in fact, I bought two more. I didn't know I had these two. They, they put together these compendium books after, well after it was dead. I didn't know they were available. So I, just, I bought both of them this week. And he, he, he talks about that like. You know, he says an interesting thing, you know, for people who are real goal achievers, and I'm trying to make the word, I'm trying to get away from goal setting as a phrase and yes. move to goal achievement. Because mm -hmm. any jackass can set goals. It's, there's nothing to it. You know, I want a pony. Mm -hmm. I want to dance with a unicorn. You know, I want to, um, you know, I want an airplane to fly out of my nose. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it's all bullshit. That's, those are, but goal achievement, and I like to think that I am somebody who has done that, mm -hmm. you know, there when you get close to a to a goal you've been working for a long time earl says it's interesting because very often you've already set the next ones are already popping out of your head uh, i've told larie that every time i finish a book i said well are you gonna be ready for another one soon she goes no stop no no stop right uh, a couple of weeks ago we yeah. decided on my next <laughs> book and i said what well, do you want it on monday and she said you stop that no, I don't okay. That's this. good. You, you have like a you have a built-in governor right there. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Because when you're writing a book and you, you finish it and you do the audible and you do mm -hmm. the you do those oh those brutal, those brutal edits and proofreading, it just never seems to end, my friend. But while you're doing that, the next book comes to you or the next in the middle of a 40-day program, easy strength, 40 days. At day 22, I'm thinking about day 41. In the 10,000 swing challenge, I'm day three. I'm thinking about what the day I finish it, what I'm going to do, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's so interesting. Do you ever, have you ever read Stephen King's book on writing? I have only pulled over on the side of the road, listening to a book a single time in my life. Mm -hmm. It was on writing by Stephen King. Wow. And when he describes where he got, I'm actually getting emotional that's that's gentle listener that's how good this when he describes where he got the inspiration for carrie it is so horrific yeah that i had to pull over to the side of the road and by the way folks it's all true and all of us listening have been on both sides of the story sadly most of us probably been on the wrong side yes so yes i know on writing quite well I know that story, you know, from that we talk about a dark side and understanding oh. that, but his, the line that he put, he has a few different lines in that mm -hmm. book that I thought were incredible, but he said, you know, to write is to be human, to edit is to be divine, you know, which <laughs> I thought was phenomenal in there because everybody has a book inside that everybody likes to write, but actually to go back and edit it and actually kind of go through the process again and again, it says is one of the most horrific, challenging things you could possibly do. In the okay, my office used to be, I have the sign 
uh, from Ernest Hemingway, right drunk, edit sober. Yes. <laughs> um, editing is, you know, so I am probably, I already have basically a full book done. My next book is basically done. And now I'm going through and realizing that, you know, now as a writer, you go through and you, you, you fill in all these, you write a chapter and you write a chapter and you write a, and so you basically, the way I write, because my book's a strength book, so it's a little simpler. I, actually, the easiest book I've read was 40 years, wrote was 40 years with the whistle because it was chronological. So the, the okay. structure was built in. So if I didn't feel like writing, I'd write something simple that day, a simple mm -hmm. story. And you can, you can almost tell because those are the ones that are the most fluid and flow the best. So, uh, you know, on the, I'm writing a book on easy strength right now. And, okay, so this section, this section, this section, I know these have to be written. Then I'll finish them and I'll realize that there, there's a need for a transition, not sentence, not paragraph, chapter. Mm -hmm. Or I think I explain it well enough. And then I realize that I need to get more depth. And so, yeah, I, I, I think, so there's, there's the editing process, but um, gosh, you know, you talk about uh, John Cleese was only rewarded for one of his, he's only been uh, given any awards for one of his movies. Uh, it's a fish called Wanda. And the reason he says it's the only one I ever rewrote. And I rewrote that one 17 times. So a fish called Wanda is, it is a fun, I mean, it's a fun movie, <laughs> but he rewrote that 17 times. And it's like, it, and it's, endurance. Mm -hmm. well, it's not it, but, but think about it this way, Mike, is that, you know, I'm a discus thrower. How many throws do I need to take to get it right? I averaged 15,000 throws for 41 years. I don't know what that is math wise, but I'm sure it's more than 50. You know, um, how many times have I told my daughters I love them? I mean, uh, every conversation I have with, every time I see Kelly, my daughter Kelly, I always stand up and I always kiss her on the hair, you know? And I'm hoping my dog doesn't throw up on my carpet right now. So that'd be nice. <laughs> start talking about my daughters and he has to throw up. Do you want to see? Do you want to meet Mike? <laughs> one of us is starting to show. What's up, us, dude? <laughs> one of us is starting to show our years. So uh, he'll, he'll probably be my last dog. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I can't. I mean, I don't mind losing, you know, mm -hmm. human companionship, but a dog. Yeah. I mean, come on. Okay, that's <laughs> only, I'm only half joking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that was that's good. Thanks for letting me uh, kind of uh, explore that a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely, appreciate that. Thanks. Has has your writing process changed over time? Just because, like, I know one of my favorite book in this field is is uh, Never Let Go. I probably read it four times. You know, wow. so it's like it really is one of my, and I've probably recommended it to more people, especially young coaches. You know, because it's not just about the strength side of it, it really kind of, it reads like a story, you know, which I always love stories, you know, growing up and then reading 40 years with a whistle, it kind of follows a very similar format, but it's almost even more uh, sharp in this book now from when you read, I don't know when you read, uh, wrote uh, Never Let Go, but it had Early to be over 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So has your process of kind of setting up a, uh, a book changed at all during this time or during the last decade? Radically. Yeah. So originally, you know, my first published works uh, were on Beowulf. In fact, it's right here. <laughs> wow. I keep threatening to, to reprint to this is, this is long before. Uh, wow. This is, um, so this is long before uh, computers even. I mean, I, this was, typed and uh, I sent it off. So Beowulf, uh, King Arthur, Utah 4-H clubs. I did a, I did a study on Utah 4-H clubs, learned some, some really interesting things. Um, articles on uh, religious education. So I was writing in that field for a long time. And of course, when you're writing about a story, you start to really appreciate you know, how well knitted, you know, Beowulf poet was. And then, you know, when you're writing something that's historical, you know, you get the chron chronology in. Let me, let me make sure I'm explaining this well. So when you're working with King Arthur and Beowulf, you, 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 you become an uh, art. Well, I did that 500 page thing on the sword and the stone where I retyped the entire book and didn't did my own uh, um, riffs on each, each paragraph. Oh. 
Yeah, because I'm a lunatic. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So when you're doing something like that, you're looking at another author and you're commenting, you, you pick up certain good skills as, a, as an author. Uh, rewriting, uh, by the way, if you are interested in being a writer, retyping a good uh, article, retyping a good short story is mind-blowing uh, to help you. Because then you, every single word, you know, you start to store it differently. Then when I started writing uh, the historical stuff, then that's when chronology became so important. Mm -hmm. And I think that helped me in, in the realm of storytelling to make sure things were in the right order. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when I was writing things for religious education, that's when I realized the importance of a story. And uh, I think I've mentioned this before, my, the late, great Jack Schrader, who just so he, who was friends with John F. Kennedy, uh, uh, the, the original, the, the president. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the editor of the Salt Lake Trib, the publisher and the editor of the Salt Lake Trib. And then he decided to be a volunteer uh, and he uh, would proofread my work. And I think I've mentioned this before, but Jack would say, you got a column published this week. And I and I'd go, yes, yes, I did. And he would sit down and he'd put it across from me and he'd go like this. He'd take his finger and go like this. He goes, boop. Right there, right there is where you hooked the reader. And then we'd look at it and he goes, see what you did there is that you, 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 you know, the phrase we used to use, you unzipped, you know, you unzipped, you, 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 you got naked in front of your reader. You, you were honest that caught him or you, this point was very strong. That little quote nailed it. And then of course, two weeks later, he'd come in and he'd take his finger and he'd scroll it down flip the paper open, scroll it down to the next page and go, mm -hmm. yeah. And it, the point being, you never hooked the reader. Huh. So Jack, Jack was, Jack was a wonderful man and I miss him, but what was good about, so I lucked out to have one of the most prolific readers and writers in uh, North America to uh, proofread my work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he was never, he didn't get, he didn't care about apostrophe S or, dot 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 you know he cared right. about where did you hook so he wasn't just some crappy editor proofreader he was someone who knew writing and that's so here's my take i mean every i mean the in almost every high school i've ever been some of the worst teachers on campus were the english teachers and i know that's brutal to say that out loud mm -hmm. by the way some of the best were also english teachers mm -hmm. but what happens sometimes you get those english teachers who just turn into uh I mean, they become auto mechanics. They're just, right. they're just telling you that the nut, you had the wrong nut or you, there, there's no, there's no art to it. They've, they've gotten rid of, right. and they've, they've gotten so weird with their red pen and their concern about apostrophe S that they missed the point that the student is writing a suicide note. Right. You mm -hmm. know, this is a suicide note. By the way, that's a famous court case from about 30 years ago. The school was sued. Um, because the kid wrote a suicide note. And it, by the way, up the down staircase has the same basic story in it too. But right. This, yes. Yeah. The kid had a wow. suicide note in a journal entry and the teacher. Yeah. You know, well, it is. I mean, it's like with, I mean, even in history, there's an art to that, you know, it's like, there's, it's a story behind it. So like teaching something like history or something like art is, or uh, like English is going to be way different than something like science where there's actually a right answer. It's like the critical thinking piece of English. It goes much, obviously, yes, punctuation. There's some foundational aspects that you need to get down into reading. But what you're talking about with the hook, which is where you really find the brutal honesty where somebody's actually engaged in that piece. You know, I remember one of the books that I read that nothing ever captured, uh, me like this book for some reason. It's not a great book, but it's by Dan Millman. It's The Journey of Socrates. His big oh, work was- see, no, I, I loved A Peaceful Warrior. Yes. And, and I could yeah. stand The Journey of Socrates. Yeah, so it's it's funny because his, his big work going. is, yeah, his big work is Way of a Peaceful Warrior. Phenomenal book. Um, you know, it's 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 stands the test of time. You know, he's written that- wrote Loaded that with what we would now say, gentle yeah. listener, if you read it now, you'll say it's just nothing but cliches. But when, when the book came out, it was all original. Unbelievable. Yeah. I first read that when I was 20 years old, much oh. different time than now being almost 40. But it's, uh, and he had two other books after that, which was Sacred Journey. And then he had The Journey of Socrates, which was a prequel all about, you know, Socrates. Right. And, and then he had, came out with another and, one too, which yeah. I didn't like either. 
Yeah. So, and it's, you know, way of the peace war, it, there's a different spice to no, that one because no, I think it was so honest. Not the one in Hawaii, but the one where he goes, he finds the book in the desert. Then he, the communists take over some village that he's at. Yeah. That's the hidden life of something, which I only got halfway through. Anyway, I love you, Dan Millman. You are phenomenal. If you, you are phenomenal, Dan yes. Millman. Yes, yes, we agree. <laughs> However, with the with the book, The Journey of Socrates, I was 100 pages in and I'm like, you know, I love this book. I'm going to give it a shot, but I really wasn't getting there. Then all of a sudden, he wrote one of the most brutal scenes about a his wife getting murdered by these. It, it was like a crusader, you know, pretty much. But the way that he wrote it was not such about what the action was, but how he was feeling during that time that he felt so helpless that he couldn't defend her. From there and you felt that so much i read the rest of that book in the next two days and there was another 250 page because i want because i was like you get invested in that character he was now going to this journey to figure out how to be the warrior which started out as a revenge and then he found the way of the peaceful warrior of saying he could actually forgive but it was like it was right at that moment that i've there's not that many books that I've read where I got so hooked within like two pages of him in that when I was like, oh shit, uh, like I just- Damn you, now I have to read the book again. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But it is, I think it's so interesting. I think, you know, a lot of, you know, people that are aspiring writers and everybody has a creative bone in them, whether you're writing a book or a novel, or if you're writing articles or emails for people, if you're young coaches and trying yeah. to work, I think that's such an important piece to, to explain. The problem most people have is- I, 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 I could probably comment on this for, for days, but uh, there's this idea that like even in a high school or a college that the creative people are the poets and the dancers and the, and really to me, I often think that, and, and we do this, we nudge creativity, at least in America, we nudge creativity into this little area where it's the artist and I have to wear weird clothes. I will put myself, I mean, when you look at the way I write things and put things, I'm, I can't really pat my back. My shoulders are sore from lifting, but I'm a freaking creative guy. I can, yeah. I constantly look at better ways to teach. I, I will be floundering for literally decades trying to come up with a better way to teach something. And it's not just weightlifting. It's all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I have the spark, this insight, Sometimes I'll start to work on something and it'll be a massive, uh, I'll do a quadrant, you know, I'll, I use quadrants to help me think. Yes. Maybe a, there's maybe half the quadrant. So of the four things, two are missing, yeah. but it doesn't matter because I know it's going to fill in when I get away from the project, when I let the creativity side come in. And then I show you this stuff and people, well, you made that simple. And it's like, I hate it when people say I make things simple because it's so freaking hard to make things simple that's the einstein quote right make it as simple as possible but not simpler <laughs> it's like that's well, a there's a fine line there but to make it simple is a lot of hard work i mean it is it's weirdly hard work and mm -hmm. to me that's the creative side and just because i refuse to wear you know all kinds of goofy clothes or be trendy doesn't mean i'm not creative mm -hmm. you know um the thing that makes me i think the most creative is the fact that I always wear basically black shirts. I, mm -hmm. I have, I am the most routine person you'll ever meet in the life. And the reason I try to have the most routines, I picked this up from the Benedictine uh, monastic tradition. The more you, there's not, I didn't say anything that would, okay. Things like eating, it's important. Uh, resting is important that they're very important, but if you can get those into a system where you don't spend so much time thinking about sleep, eating this this and this it frees up your mind to do the the, the more gorgeous things of life yeah that's the free will right you only oh, have yeah. so much throughout the day exactly that's right and why waste it on yeah. why waste if i've got that out with my phone i've got mm -hmm. these alarms and i i had an alarm go off an hour before we met up mm -hmm. an alarm went up 15 minutes before an alarm went up 10 minutes before mm -hmm. you'll notice i was on the site before you were mm -hmm. yes you were I didn't do anything. Uh, the alarm was just went off. Yeah. I said it this morning. I, forgot, I didn't even remember what the hell was going off for at 11. Yeah. I'd look at it and go, oh, God, I got a podcast in an hour. I better be yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> do you think that creative process, did that start, do you believe, with the athletic career of coaching where it's like you, you knew like to continuously keep progressing and to make sure that the athletes were getting what they needed to, that you needed to, that you couldn't well, rest on your laurels of training? 
Have we met personally? I want to say we have. You know what? It's funny. I talked with Alex Salkin the other day, and it was 10 years ago that we met at Easy Strength at that summit in Reno when you and Pavel you know, met from there. I think, I think that was the last time that we saw each other, which is, I can't believe it was 10 years ago. Okay. Am I small or big? I would say you're a big guy. Yeah, but I wasn't. So as a, as when I was a freshman, I, I didn't hit puberty until I was in college. True. So I think I became creative as an, uh, all these things because I wanted to win. I weighed 118 pounds as a ninth grader throwing the discus against guys who weighed 160 pounds for God's sakes. These guys were enormous. The coaches were talking about, we need big guys. And I can remember. And I look back now and I'm like, no, you don't. You need tight ends. You need linebackers, yes. you need strong safeties, you know? So since I couldn't out muscle these guys, cause they were, some of them had hit puberty. They were five, nine, one sixty. They had beards in the ninth grade. Well, I talk like this, you know? <laughs> so they did standing throws and I did turns the next year. They tried to learn how to turn, but I was in discus throwing shoes. So I went better the next year. They were, I was already doing this. So trying to win made me always try to outthink, outwit the opponent. Gotcha. And that, and I think that is what you want from a coaching staff. You know, um, there's this, there is an HBO or Netflix film uh, about Bill Belichick and Nick Saban and the two of them. And there's this moment where they forget to turn their, they, they turn off the live camera, but they don't, Nick and Bill don't know that they have their active labor mics, whatever they're called. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so we hear this conversation that they don't want anyone to hear. And they're talking about how you force, you you play the four outside, outside containment in this three, two defense that they're developing literally as we're watching. And here you got Bill Belichick, who's got, I think it's six Super Bowls Mm -hmm. and Nick Saban has got seven national championships and they're both leaning in, you know, trying to figure out quietly how to, how to outwit mm-hmm. your future opponents. I love it. Isn't that amazing? You know, yeah. The overnight successes of those guys. It's incredible. Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> and I think, I think to me, anytime you take a moment, I mean a moment and think of a better way to do things, uh, you, you're letting that creative mind explode. And most of the people I know, honestly, um, there's, you know, I'm a strong believer that you are the sum of your habits. Okay. So Mm -hmm. who's sitting in that chair right now, Michael, you, you earn that. Mm -hmm. It took you 40 years to get that body in that Mm -hmm. face. You know, you look at my nose, you can tell I've broken it. I've earned this space. Mm -hmm. You know, I've broken my nose six times, broken tooth, broken, you know, three surgeries. None of it helps. I still look like hell. Mm -hmm. But you are the sum of your habits. So when I say to you, yeah, I rarely breakfast. I, uh, I only eat after I've worked out the many people listen. Well, I couldn't do that. I could not do that. I have got to have my, you, no, you don't, you don't got to have anything. That is your habits. You are this. And if you're 300 pounds overweight, it wasn't that one Pepsi versus diet Pepsi. You earn that extra 300 pounds in the same way that a marathon runner earns crossing the finish line. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I was talking with my, my good friend, Tyler, on his podcast earlier, and we were talking about Tyler, those fra- Tyler Wall. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tyler Wall from Contrasted Design. Um, and we had a, the whole conversation we really had was about doing shadow work and the dark side and knowing how to embrace that side of your mental psyche, which is a very interesting you know, conversation. But we said about like the things when you say, I'm the type of guy that, or I'm a person who does, it's like, no, you're not. It's like, that is just the habit that you built up of doing it that way. It's like, as soon as you say that, you're limiting yourself of doing anything else besides that. So you're given kind of a nice, just little like, you know, block of like a push off of like, no, I can't do that because that's not who I am. It's like, no, you're not. It's like, you're just labeling yourself. Is that which I think you're kind of saying in the same is like it's it's a habit that builds yeah, up. everything and you know even if we're playing a simple thing like card games I'm going to try to 
learn the game and get better as as we play even though it's a family game we play this game called golf mm-hmm. it's just a card game there's no big deal to it you know but i'm trying to i will experiment with ways of winning and people go well that was stupid you know and i'll say no i looked around and i i thought there's no way you could have a a king ace two or three Mm -hmm. i knew anything above a four i was going to win and you had a two and you win and that's okay because the the statistics were on my side and and they'll look at me like, well, we're just playing cards. And I'll be like, oh, that's right. We're just playing cards. Right. But we are playing. It's the same mindset. Exactly. You're still playing. It's just playing. like it's just like the Highland Games. Yeah, <laughs> Except it's in the living room. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is an important thing to talk about. I, I cannot, to, to overcome self-defeating thoughts. Oh, that's a tough one. I, I see it quite often. And I, I, if people ask me, you know, give me, Dan, I'd do anything. Just give me a perfect diet and exercise program. There is no perfect diet. Every diet works absolutely fantastically. South Beach diet is amazing. Uh, paleo is freaking amazing. Low carb is perfect. High carb is the best thing you could ever do. Cut out all your fats. Go all fat. Go keto. P- give me bread makers mm-hmm. diet. Belly kills me. Di- belly bread kills me diet doesn't matter Mm -hmm. stick to it or don't stick to it it doesn't even then it doesn't matter right it is that but it is that 10 year 365 366 twice in that 10 years Mm -hmm. uh it's that commitment that's going to get you it's the the day in day out it's the habits you know, uh, when people ask me about, and I'll talk about floss in your teeth, and I'll be like, oh, I always forget. And I'm like, well, I just put the floss sticks, you know, in the little driver's side thing, and I floss when I drive. And then the response will be, well, I can't do that. That'd be weird. Well, you think walking around at 350 pounds isn't weird? Yeah. You know, when you show up at the pool and your kids are embarrassed because, you know, mm-hmm. you, you know you're in a, you're a man and you're wearing a muumuu. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. what's, what's weirder? you know yeah. well kind of goes to, yeah kind of goes back to your point with the guy with the power curls of like if you never done it before and it's like you think it's weird it's like well give it a try and just get it go but it's the self limiting to it's the self limiting beliefs you said in those self defeating you know thoughts like and you know it's like it's one of the things that i've seen a lot of that i've kind of pondered is the the failure is not an option type message of stuff like that it's like it's i i understand what you're doing like you're putting some motivation into your head and it's fueling you to get you know next and you're going to win however failure is an option like you could lose that game and knowing that you're being going to be okay doing that it's actually like you get yourself into a level that's bigger than just what you're doing in that moment i believe Uh i have experimented and i've gone to track Mm -hmm. in the discus important track meets uh with an, an additional turn in the discus because some people believe still that 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 is a better way to throw and i'll be at a meet doing a two-turn throw and people be like what are you doing i've done weird stances i've had i've started weightlifting meets with my heels together i started with because that it meets and i'm like it's if i'm right on this i'm going to move ahead and if i'm wrong we shrug our shoulders and we do it again you know right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so it is interesting because there is there is a little bit of experimentation. I would say probably in and just just using Pareto's laws, mm-hmm. probably 20% of what you do gives you 80% of the benefit. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you eat protein, eat vegetables and drink water at every meal, you're gonna be it's 80% of what nutrition is. Yeah. You can argue with me what the other 20 is, but if you're not doing that 80%, I want to shut up. Um, if I, I just read an interesting thing. There's a, there's a Hollywood fitness trainer who only allows men 1,600 calories a day, but they have to do 1,600 steps a day. 16,000 steps a day, I'm sorry. 1,600 calories, 16,000 steps. And he's getting success. And I'm like, well, no shit. We know that if you put oils on 1,200 calories a day, within a few weeks, they literally go insane. Not they go insane, literally go insane. 
Uh, that was the famous Minnesota studies uh, after World War II about starvation, when they were trying to figure out how to help people in, for future wars, mm -hmm. and future Holocaust issues and stuff uh -huh. like that. So a whole bunch of conscientious objectors uh, went on 1,200 calories a day. It's called the Minnesota study. It's very famous. Mm -hmm. And they all started becoming crazier than loons. And the, here's the interesting thing. Uh, a whole bunch of the men never recovered. They had these they had these fantasies about food, and they were all they all started licking their plates after every single meal. They were licking the one guy was licking the plate so much they were worried about his tongue health. Really? Well, yeah, because at twelve hundred calories a day, you start going loony. Yeah, yeah. And so my I guess my point is, uh, gentle listener, if you're eating sixteen hundred calories a day and walking sixteen thousand steps and lifting with me three days a week you'd better effing make some progress. Yeah. <laughs> you are going right on the edge that you may never recover from. Yeah. And here's the shitty thing is that if you're only doing it for a photo shoot or a, um, I'm thinking about the one guy, he made a movie and instead of training with uh, the rest of the group uh, doing uh, uh, lower, they all decided as a group to lower their carbohydrates and do one really hard workout a day. Mm -hmm. Um but this guy decided, nah, I'm going to take anabolic steroids and train with a, a bodybuilding champion. Well, if you see this actor today, you know, he's just a big round tub. But if you look at the other actors who did it the other way, they still maintain the bulk of what they learn. So, you know, it, I get, what, I'm, what I'm trying to put together here is that, you know, it, it's all going to work, but what is sustainable, repeatable, and doable is eating protein and veggies and drinking water every meal, sleeping mm -hmm. eight, nine hours plus every night, mm -hmm. you know, do three whole body workouts a week. Mm -hmm. Every time you lift weights, you go for a half hour walk and then you walk, you walk mm -hmm. every, every day anyway. Exactly. And magically in mm -hmm. 20 years, <laughs> overnight in 20 years, you look better. Yeah. And well, and that's it. And, you know, as you could see in this book, you know, from 40 years, like it takes that much time and effort and energy to get that simple of an explanation down there. Yeah. The work in there. Yeah. So one of the things, Dan, I did want to bring up uh, with you is um, you brought up this concept of the two communities. I forget the original reference of what it was, but we said there's like the horizontal communities and then there's the vertical communities. Yeah, it's, a and concept, most of, it's a concept from good theology. Okay. Yeah. And you said most people, we miss the vertical communities where the horizontal is more our friends, our family, the people that you're connected with a lot. Okay. But then the vertical is more the stories, the tiny connections that we get that really create that next level of community. Yeah. So, you know, St. Patrick shows up in Ireland and he, he <laughs> shares this faith. That person shared it with this person, blah, 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 all the way down to my mother who shared it with me. And now I'm sitting in this chair now. So if we decide to change something, we have to talk to the vertical community a little bit. You know, um, if it, it, and this is my knock on, well, certainly the one, you know, the high intensity people, they didn't talk to the, the vertical community when they came up with one set to failure. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they had a machine that fit this protocol. And by the way, if you're only, if you have 12 machines and everybody has to do one set to failure, every single machine, you can run people through that facility very fast mm -hmm. and yeah it is expensive to have 12 you know 12 to twenty four thousand dollar machines but you're going to have someone at every station bum 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 it's like an extreme curves it, well we can talk about curves too but um, so but we have known the what the vertical community says in weightlifting this goes back to hack it goes back to I mean, it, pick a country and the Louis Sear, pick a country and they'll agree with this. Basically, without anabolic support, three whole body workouts a, a day, a, a week, pardon me, three whole body workouts a week. Uh, you want to, if it's a hypertrophy time, 15 to 30 total reps, if it's strength, around 10 total reps per exercise. I just, which is, by the way, easy strength, easy strength, you know, one on one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, hack and schmidt talked about it tommy kono basically i mean i'm reading tommy kono's work again and it's like uh, he he 
that thing I wrote called easy strength for fat loss with Olympic lifting. Mm -hmm. It's just a nod to Tommy Kono. And um, the vertical community then is when you make a decision, either physically ask if the people are still around, we're going to do this. And, or you kind of uh, do it, Dale, Dale Carnegie, uh, Carnegie or Carnegie, whatever it is this week, you know, where you have, you pretend to ask them, you know, the room full of your, your heroes, you know, and you, you, okay. yeah. you, you know, maybe, you know, um, uh, President Clinton famously had. Oh, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he used uh, Abraham Lincoln as one of his. And well, what would Abraham Lincoln do? You know, right, what, right. Okay. W, w, whenever you see what would Jesus do, that's a vertical community thing. Gotcha. Okay. So vertical community is when you when you look at a situation and, and I, I turn to you, Mike, and I say, okay, this kid keeps missing his snatches because he's, you know, rolling up onto his toes. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would probably tell him to stay on his heels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, I'll go with that. So that would be vertical coaching. Vertical okay. community coaching. So vertical community is when you you just check and make sure that it's appropriate and applicable to the generations before you. But, and don't forget this part, then you shift and look down. For example, you know, my daughters were both throwers. And I know a lot of women who've done anabolic steroids and it's bad. It's very mm-hmm. bad. A good friend of mine, uh, she is, uh, she's got all kinds of long-term issues from her anabolic steroid use. So when someone says to me, ah, would you ever give your girls steroids? My response, for, there's two reasons. Two, no, I would never do that because that's, that's horrific to even say that sense. But the other thing is, is when I look down past their life, okay, say they are a really good division one thrower. They graduated 22. Well, then what? Well, then what? You know, you've got that, you've got the, the big, the big swollen neck and you've got mm-hmm. the hormonal issues. You might, you have voice box changes that don't get fixed. Uh, you got that, mm-hmm. you know, that rough acne look, you know, that, that, that scarish, that hard, that hard jaw, uh, the weird elbows. <laughs> These are just some of them. Uh, some other issues uh, sexually that don't change. Mm-hmm. By God, why would I, and I'm going to use a tough word here, why would I poison my daughters for a few years of throwing farther? You know, I mean, uh, when people talk about, well, I mean, if you, it, for example, you know, I, I, I don't, my family was not wealthy at all. We were, we were not wealthy. We didn't have any money. <laughs> so I think if we had been even a little bit poorer, I could have seen myself staying in American football and trying to make it a professional level. I don't know if I could have, you know, but, and just to earn some money to help my family. Just the financial path was different. Mm-hmm. But here's mm-hmm. the same. Here's what my brother Ray said to us when he went to Vietnam, I'm going, so you guys don't have to go. Here's what my brother uh, Gary said when he went to Vietnam, I'm going, so you don't have to go to. My brother Phil took me aside one side time and said, I'm doing this so you don't have to. And uh, that's the way, to me, that's, to me, that's a beautiful example of <laughs> a failed example of vertical community when you do something so that your little brother doesn't have to go fight this war. Yeah. Okay. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it is different. And I think it's so it's, it just gets to a different level of, of purpose. You know, it's like, I mean, obviously we have our close knit community of our family, our friends, the people that we see every day, the, the ones there's unconditional love, but that next level of it, which is where really some deep connections can happen in just small encounters or just small thoughts. And if you have those, and, you know, I've done that, you know, for years, I've, you know, met you a couple times, but in 10 years, you've been in my head in multiple different ways of coaching because I knew, okay, this is what coach John would do, you know, or this is what Danny do. What would Danny do? Exactly. (laughs) Eat protein protein and veggies. So, you know, I think about it, you know, when I was coaching football at a specific school here in Salt Lake with a great football tradition, every so often we'd bring in uh, someone who'd gone out to play college ball or just a guy who played a couple of years ago. And they would come in and they would always say the same things. You guys don't know how wonderful this is. Me and my friends talk about these things all the time. You know, don't miss a workout. 
go as hard as you can, listen to everything on the scouting reports. And then they would leave and I'd always tell the group, I would say to them, here's what's interesting. In about five years, I'm gonna ask you to come back and give the same message. And you know what? No one in that room will listen to you either. And it was always an unpopular, I, I would say it actually much harsher. And the idea was you often can't listen to the vertical community, even though the vertical community is screaming to you. Wow. Because you don't know what you're looking for yet. Is that maybe? Because you're a 16 year old boy. Because you, <laughs> you can, or because it's it's nothing deeper than it's nothing deeper than that. I get this all the time <laughs> about Mike. I get this all the time. You know why don't more people listen to you? Well, because I'm 65. I'm ugly. I don't show off my abs. I don't. I don't put boobs in my Instagram posts. I don't show my butt, although it is, it's a delightful, it's, it's well, I mean, very tall. You might remember it's, I got good glutes. I'm not sexy. I don't, there is no, I don't have a magic formula for anything in life. You know, here's, you know, I, I, my number one coaching point is embrace the obvious. Do you know how unpopular embrace the obvious is? Writers write, singers sing, dancers dance, throwers throw, jumpers jump. Sprint or sprint. So coach, what should I do? What event are you? Hurdle. You should hurdle. Well, I mean, what should I do? <laughs> you should hurdle. You, how, how many times have you run the whole race? I uh, never. Then hurdlers hurdle. So you've never done, you're, you're a 400 intermediate hurdler and you, and you only practice the first two or three hurdles. Yeah, because I want to make sure I get my timing down. Well, good. You got great timing for, you know, 70 meters, but that other 330 seems to be the issue while, as I watch you gas after that, because you hit 14, 14, 14, 28, 39 steps. You know, you're, you're not in shape. You need to run the event. 400 intermeter hurdles, ers do 400 meter hurdles. Divers dive. I love it. There's no sex. Yeah. You, can't get, yeah. you know, I don't, That's, as I'm sitting here, mm -hmm. I don't have an ultraviolet thing on my table, you know, uh, mm -hmm. sending healthy beams to my inner thighs and genitals. You know, I'm not drinking. Oh, so this is, this is mushroom berry extract with just a hint of ooglagla and just a, a no, I, I drink coffee and I drink water. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, by the way, I this just, so, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, okay, I'm going to give you a joke first, but mm -hmm. I really cut down on my drinking. I only drink now if I'm alone mm -hmm. with somebody. Okay, so that's the joke. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, one thing I really did uh, because of COVID is I really just ratcheted down my drinking. Uh, I also, um, I decided to get my body weight down a lot. And uh, and people, uh, it's funny because I last year I went from 251 to 231 in just a few months. I did the 10,000 swing challenge. I'm sorry. I did the 10,000 swing challenge and uh, I put two pounds on because the 10,000 swing challenge is not a good, uh, it's not a good fat loss protocol. It's a good workout. It's a good challenge. Um, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. my, my phone is telling me we're having a podcast. <laughs> uh, oh, no way. Thank <laughs> you. What the hell? Uh, so... But where I lost my weight was when I started lifting weights every morning in an easy strength fashion. Uh, I did press, mm -hmm. pull up, deadlift, ab wheel, five times 15 swings, and then went for a 45 minute heavy hands walk, like three pounds in each hand. Well, from there, okay, so I, I start the year off at 249. Into January, I'm up to 251. February, uh, March, April, I'm lifting in a meet at 102 at 224. Mm -hmm. Well, what did you do? What do you mean? What did I do? Well, this 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 is this this is important. If you this makes sense to me, why I'm telling you the story. 
it might not make sense to anybody. How did I go from 251 to 224 in a few months? Well, I woke up, I drank coffee, I waited until after I worked out and walked, and then I ate a meal heavy in protein and veggies, and I drank water, worked in the afternoon, had another meal, protein, veggies, drank water, ate kimchi and sauerkraut, got eight, nine, 10 hours sleep. I meditate every day for 15 minutes. And I did that. And they go, well, so what did you do to do? I just told you literally everything I did to go from 251 to 224 and lift really well in that knee. Yes. But what, but what did you do? <laughs> All I did was these small, tiny, daily. When Coach Mon said, lift weights three times a week, throw the discus four times a week for the next eight years, Mike, everybody misses the eight years part. Everybody misses that five days a week, sleep, coffee, fast, lift, walk, protein, veggies, water, repeat you know, and that's what people miss. And for me, when someone says to me, Hey, Dan, in a hundred years, what would be the best way for humans to lose body fat? I'm going to tell them exactly what I just told you right now. Yes. It's the consistency. And of course, what Art Devaney said, don't get fat in the first place, but you know, <laughs> that one. It is, well, like you said, it's the simple message of it, but I think it was Paul McElroy when I you know talked to him last week and said, foundations make fortunes. It's like, so eventually you do get the foundations down and it will build your fortune. It's just going to take some time. You know, it's funny to say that because I just came off the best month in my financial career. Mm -hmm. So I, I set up a new goal. I, I have, uh, well, I, I don't, the other one, this might be one of them. Yeah, it is actually. Okay. So uh, this, these aren't great examples. Oh, this one's pretty good. Okay. So this is January 22nd. 22nd. And what I do every day is I write down, I know you can't see it very well and I apologize, but my goal is to get to 211, uh, not for this upcoming weightlifting meet, but you know, kind of like I'm not, I hate to say it, it's Utah, it's winter. I'm not going to lose a lot of weight. Today I had to shovel snow at 6 a.m. That's how I started my day. It, it's 26 degrees outside Fahrenheit, uh, minus two or three Celsius. But uh, so every day, uh, I, I take a piece of paper and I slice it down the middle and I put the 211 goal. And I don't want you to know that one, but basically it's doubling my business per month. It's a number. And every day I write down, uh, this is not a good example, but I, I spitball some ideas every single morning about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to improve on everything that, you know, um, it, it's interesting because well, yesterday, I thought the best way for me to double my income is by decluttering. So yesterday, I went through and I, I buy, uh, I'm not advertising them, but I like them called Barbell Brand Pants and Clothes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the pants are amazing. Guys like me, you know, built, I'm like, I'm built funny. Um, it's, I don't know how to say this. I'm bigger than... <laughs> I'm bigger than people think I am, but I'm built funny. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah, I got big thighs and a narrow waist. And I'm sure there's people going, oh, geez, he's still folding himself. So, <laughs> so yesterday I went through and I realized that I had a pair of black jeans from bar uh, and a pair of workout pants, two pairs of blue jeans that I didn't like the way they looked at me. And then I found these other shirts. And so I, I bundled everything up. Um, I went upstairs and Leo has some baby clothes that I can keep. I went through and I, and I donated all these really nice $150 a pair of pants. And then I redid my whole little uh, clothes closet. And I walked in there this morning and I went, this is why you declutter. I was like lighter. It's, it's true. 100%. Someone's going to say, well, how did that double your income for a month? I don't, I don't know. I don't know, but it certainly worked Yes. in one month. My income went up 50% in one month, but you're missing the whole point. If that's all you're hearing, what I did was I wrote down 
to numerical goals. So when I weigh myself in in the morning, when I weigh in myself in the morning, so today is, I haven't done this yet today. So it's because it was, a, mm -hmm. I started the day by shoveling. <laughs> so I'm going to write 211 because that's 96 kilos and I'm write the number I want to make a month. I'm going to write down what today's weight was and I'm going to write down snow and then I'm going to write down my workout and then I'm going to write down why I'm not getting down to 211, what I need to do. And then I'm going to write down on the other one because for me, goal achievement is all about, it's, it's, he said foundations make fortunes. Yes. But to make a foundation, you have to have one brick and you take that one brick and you go like this. And then you take the next brick. And this is important. People miss this part. You then put the next brick on top of it or to the side of it. Then you take the next brick and then pretty soon you have all the bricks down in a row and then you build the second row. Then you build the third and then you build the other walls and you, know, you build mm -hmm. the art. But it's one brick. And to me, what people miss is that each and every day is a brick. Yes. And I try really hard to never, I mean, obviously I have goals. I mean, I, I'm, I look downstream and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do this and this and this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to achieve, but I'm going to achieve those goals, not by, not by something that's coming up. It's by taking care of business today. Yes. It's by checking, you know, uh, right now, as I'm talking to you, it's pretty obvious to me I haven't had enough water. Mm -hmm. Of course, we've been talking and, mm -hmm. yep. uh, and I just got finished working out. So, so I'm gonna have to go out and drink more water. I know that, but here's the funny thing. That glass of water, and the reason I keep referring to it is right there, uh, that glass of water, and then I drink more water, that's what's going to get me to lifting in the 96 kilo class. It's not some magical thing that's going to magically happen in three weeks. It's these two, three, four glasses of water in the next two hours. Yes. It's, I'll probably take another uh, meditation break today because um, I, I'm, I'm deep into writing. And when I get deep into writing, sometimes... I can't just take a walk away break. I have to actually just turn my mm -hmm. brain off and not off. Mm -hmm. I have to, for 15 minutes, listen to a boring British guy go, breathing is the most important aspect, the uncontrollable. God, no wonder British women are so sad. That every time the <laughs> British guy talks, I fall right asleep. Um, <laughs> I'm coming back for you, Britain. Uh, oh my gosh. But so, so you just do these things and, and you're going to say, well, how does 15 minute meditation help you get down to 211 pounds? Well, cause, cause I do that every day and sometimes twice a day. Mm -hmm. And it's just these little bricks and foundations build fortunes. I love it. It is right. It's a, and if you do that, like then, you know, you're going to be doing it again the next day. So the shoveling the snow this morning, all of a sudden doesn't throw you completely off because you know that you're going to do it again tomorrow. <laughs> and put another brick down in the foundation what was funny about this morning is that when i opened up my closet again i looked and even though i didn't know it was gonna snow this snowstorm really mm -hmm. it's called a lake effect storm so no one was really ready for it it's it's a combination of things with the great salt lake and the mountains and and it happens and it's great so i open up the closet with my stuff and there's my duck boots there's my sweats my gloves are upstairs as you walk out and it was all ready to go because without even knowing it by decluttering, I set myself up for a more successful day today. Awesome. Yeah. Dan, you're the best man. I love sure. talking Thank to you. you. Yeah, no, this is great. So are we going to do this again soon? Oh, 100%. So I was there talk any topics you didn't get to? No, I don't think so. I mean, I really was I'm so excited to hear about just the, the work that you've done with writing and getting into it. Cause I know we've talked so much about strength and I know this is even another Avenue and a Valley that is, is so huge and exciting to me. And I know it's going to be, you know, it's, you know, something with the listeners as well. That's going to help. No, it's all about me. Just whatever. Here's an interesting, <laughs> yeah. Here's an interesting thing, Mike, and it go, goes with the whole topic. You know, I'm writing a new book, right? Yes, I do. Did you notice that it's not on my. It's not. Well, you said it's already I, pretty much written, right? Because every day I work on those bricks of the book. Yes. That writing a book to me is just like, yeah, of course you're write a book. 
you know, and this is, I know how to do it. You know, I know I, gentle listener. I I'm cheating on this. This is my 15th book. So I know what, yes. what to do, but you'd also say, well, Dan, you've dieted down for weightlifting meets before. Yeah. And you've had careers. Yeah. But these are numbers. And so I know that in the fall, this new book's going to happen because every day I work on it. Mm-hmm. Every day I build bricks for this book. And some days they're not very good bricks. Exactly. That's that's the key right there. Some days it's not it's not a great brick. Yeah. But you got another one tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And you just keep coming back. And the thing is today about my okay, on my fat loss thing, you know, I'm sure there was yeah, it wasn't this past weekend, maybe it was the weekend before. You know, I was at my daughter's house watching the championships, not the champion, the, the week before the champ, what that matter. Mm-hmm. And I just shoveled food down. I mean, I ate so many <laughs> processed meats and cheeses and uh, crap. And, and it was probably not the best thing. So what? It was one day. Yes. And then, and then, but you know, if you have 10 bad days in a year, you have 355 days to deal with it. If you have 50 bad days, you still have a fairly large bucket of days to fix yeah. it. And if you have writer's block, well, I don't have, I never get writer's block because all I do, if I start to write, I don't, uh, I just go to some other thing. Mm-hmm. I just start writing another chapter or, yeah. or I answer emails or I go online and answer Instagram questions or whatever. Yeah. So I write to break through writer's block in the same way. Oh. I drink to get through thirst. Love it. Mm. So, yeah, Dan, thank you so much, man. This time just flies by with you, but we're going to have to do this again and just keep rolling. So, and uh, let's do this next month. This is, we just, as the the date might Mm -hmm. not, but let's just pick up and and, and do this again next month. Okay. Absolutely. 100%. And I know you've got a trip coming up. So safe travels on that. Um, Dan, Dan, John.net. That's where you can find all of Dan's stuff, correct? Is that the best place to send people? Yeah. Well, actually, Dan John University, and let's give your uh, listeners a code so they can get it really cheap. And the code will be E-S-P-E-N. E-S-P-E-N. Not not the Entertainment and Sports Programming Network, but make sure there's an E between P and N, okay? It means something E-S-P-E-N. to me. But it, yeah. E-S-P-E-N, okay? And then they'll get a massive discount. And the goal setting course, if you're a member, is 15 bucks. And I think it's, check that, the goal achievement course, damn it. Yes, <laughs> yes perfect. Um, yes, we will have that down there. Uh, listeners, you'll be able to get on that. Thank you so much, Dan, for doing that. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. And uh, I will see you in a few weeks. We'll get this rolling and we'll just keep going on this because this is this is important stuff. It really is you know, for where we need to be. Uh, listeners, thank you so much for connecting. If you want to, Uh, Jump on and follow more with Dan. You know where to do so. And I'm going to catch you on the next one. Bye, guys.